Welcome to the fourth webinar in the USDA Food Processing from Soup to Nut series. Today we'll be talking about Order Management and Monitoring Part 2. And now we have our first polling question. Where do you work? Are you a processor, state agency, school district, USDA employee, or other? It looks like about a quarter of you today are processors followed by about 20% state agency staff. So we're glad all of you are able to join us and we hope you find the information useful for your work. And now I'll hand the presentation over to Peggy Canfield, the branch chief of the Child Nutrition Operations Branch to provide an introduction. Good afternoon. We are going to do order management part two in the processing series. The target audience for this webinar is obviously processors and state agency, order managers and processing specialists in the state agency. School districts and WebSTM receiving organizations might find this information also useful. Now, first, since we know where you are from, we would like to introduce the branch staff that will be presenting and explain where we're located in the Food Distribution Division. Food Distribution Division is the division in the Food Nutrition Service located at USDA headquarters. Our division is organized into six branches. The team that is presenting this webinar will be coming from Child Nutrition Operations Branch and Program Integrity and Monitoring Branch as we both have important roles in managing the processing program. Child Nutrition Operations Branch manages the food orders, the raw material supplies, the National Processors Monthly Performance Report, and reconciliation of sales orders and inventory reports. We work directly with the states and the processors and the Agriculture Marketing Service on a daily basis to ensure that orders are processed timely and flow smoothly through the system. We also work out procurement and delivery issues when needed. We manage the national monthly performance reports and facilitate transfers from state to state and reconcile sales orders and receipts. And at the national level, monitor monthly performance reports against the bond. Program Integrity and Monitoring Branch is responsible for oversight of the National Processing Agreement, enforcing the terms of the agreement, approving end product data schedules and summary end product data schedules. They do review processor audits and follow up on audit findings as well as management evaluations. They manage the complaints and they also manage holds and recalls. That said, I'd like to go over the topics that will be covered. We will do a recap of order receiving and monthly performance reporting, national inventory reconciliation and bond monitoring responsibilities, managing inbound orders and transfers, and state responsibilities and MPR tools to manage the monthly performance reports as well as state suite procedures. We have three presenters doing this. It is a division-wide effort. Mark Crudson from Child Nutrition Operations Branch, and I will read a short bio. Mark joined the Food Nutrition Service in 2003 in the Food Distribution Program Household Operations Branch. In his current position, working as the National School Lunch Program, he is a food order manager as well as a member of the Ad Hoc PITS Processing Initiatives Team. Mark works on dairy, eggs, fish, as well as reviewing monthly performance reports and overseeing inventory protection. Our next speaker, Sherry Thackery, is in Program Integrity and Monitoring Branch. Sherry's Program Analyst. She has a degree in food science. She has been with the Department of Agriculture for almost 19 years. She started in the Agriculture Marketing Service. 15 years of her career has been in food distribution in the pits also. And she is known as the Dairy Queen due to her expertise in dairy products and technology. We also will be hearing from Shanique Bridges. She began her federal career in 2014 at the Southeast Regional Office as a program specialist. Prior to joining USDA, Shanique worked with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services in the Bureau of Food Distribution in a variety of capacities monitoring the USDA foods program and processing program for the state of Florida for over 13 years. And with that said, we will turn the webinar over to Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. Now let's recap what we said about receiving and receding during USDA foods order management part one. 
You should receive an advance ship notice or ASN from the vendor approximately two to five business days prior to delivery of a sales order and should ensure the plant or warehouse is aware of the order and ready to provide a delivery appointment when the vendor transportation company calls. The best practices when you receive direct delivery of USDA foods is to check the temperature of frozen and refrigerated foods, verify quantity of product received, and examine the quality of product and condition of packaging and containers before the truck leaves. Take photos if problems are observed. Also note any problems on the bill of lading. Once the sales order is received, the goods receipt must be entered in Web SCM within two calendar days of the receipt by the state, receiving warehouse, or processor. The goods receipt, which can be entered by the processor or the state distributing agency, recipient agency order manager, should provide the details on what was received, when, how, who signed for it, if there was any damage, shortage, or overage, and a description of any damage being reported. Defective materials should be reported to the state distributing agency that placed the order so that a USDA foods complaint may be started in Web SEM. And it is important that delivered product is examined prior to signing the bill of lading and releasing the truck. Once again, we are providing the complaint hotline phone number and complaint mailbox address for your reference. There is one unique item that we need to emphasize in terms of how it is to be handled in Web SEM, and that is split shipments. For split shipments, the goods receipts entered into Web SEM should match the quantities receded from the bills of lading for each part of the split. Transfers may be processed if necessary to make the quantities match state allocations. For processor receipt split shipments, the receipts and transfers should be shown on the monthly performance reports. For bulk cheddar barrel and processor packed mozzarella cheese, we have a modified perfect truckload pilot. Nine processors are participating in this pilot for school year 2017, including Alpha Foods Company, Bungard's Creameries, Bosco's Pizza Company, Conagra Foods, Giorgio Foods, JTM, Land Lakes, Nardone Brothers Baking Company, and Schwann's Food Service. The pilot's goal is to reduce the guesswork for orders of these two cheeses by making up short delivered state orders with twice yearly FNS ordered truckloads into a USDA account. Processors receiving these two cheeses receipt in Web SEM for the quantities actually received and allocate and transfer out to state accounts from the USDA account based on receipt shortages so that the states receive the full quantity requested on each sales order. The processor or receiving organization is responsible for entering a shipment receipt in Web SEM when goods are delivered. To do this in Web SEM, click on the Operations tab, Order Processing tab, Shipment Receipts folder, and enter Shipment Receipt link. Enter the order number for the order you wish to receipt. This can be the sales order number, purchase order number, or delivery document number. Click Search. Searching by the three types of documents discussed will bring up a list of purchase orders linked to the number you entered. After clicking Search, a table displays showing all purchase orders that match your search criteria. Click the link for the line item you wish to receipt. Within the order, there may be multiple line items. Select the line item you wish to receive by checking the checkbox in the row column. Enter the following fields. Signed by is the person at the customer organization who signed for the delivery. Date received is the date on which the delivery was signed for. Railcore slash BOL is the document number for the bill of lading. And comments is a free text field for entry of comments about the delivery. Click Submit Receipt. If you wish to receipt and have checked the checkbox for all line items on the order and there were no damages or shortages, click Receipt All. It is important to note that information added to the receipt header will only populate line items if you click Receipt All. States and processors need to accurately receipt on the bill of lading as they receive product into the warehouse and in Web SCM. Processors have the added responsibility of accurately receiving in their monthly performance reports so that the receipt data agrees in all three places. If you have received damaged goods, you will want to indicate that on the receipt by clicking the box in the damaged quantity column, entering the information about the damaged goods, including the quantity damage, when it was discovered, carrier information, and any miscellaneous details, and then clicking the OK button to submit the form. If after entering a goods receipt, you find that an error has been made, 
You will need to let the FNS specialist know as soon as possible so that the goods receipt may be reversed, allowing you to correct and resubmit it. Once the vendor invoice for an order has been paid, the goods receipt cannot be changed. Okay, let's talk a little about the impact of material receipts on the state and national monthly performance reports, or MPRs. A sales order received into a processor adds to the inventory on hand at that processor and is entered into the state and national MPRs in the month in which it is received. The order quantities receipted for in the MPRs should match the goods receipt quantities entered into WebSEM. So why should you care? At the state level, available material inventory determines the type and quality and quantity of processed end items that can be ordered, but until used ties up entitlement, and unused inventory leaves money on the table that can be used to fill a plate. As a processor, available inventory represents potential sales, but leads to higher warehousing and or replacement costs if not drawn down timely, and excess inventory increases sales costs and leads to higher surety bonds, which increases the cost to the schools. National MBRs are received from processors participating in the National Processing Agreement, or NPA, program. July through May, national MBRs are due by the end of the month following the month being reported, while the final June national MBR is due by the end of the month, two months following the month being reported, or August 31st. Each national MBR that we receive goes through a number of validation checks, all of which should also have been completed by the MPA processor prior to the report being submitted. The beginning inventory quantities are verified against the prior month report's ending inventory quantities and should be the same. The received this month quantities are verified against the goods receipts entered in WebSCM. The received year-to-date, use reduced year-to-date, transfers year-to-date, and adjustments year-to-date quantities are verified against the prior month's respective year-to-date quantities plus current month's this month quantities. The report and accompanying email are also checked to verify that brief descriptions of current month transfers and adjustments have been included. The ending inventory quantities are verified to ensure that they total the beginning inventory plus received this month minus use reduced this month plus transfers this month plus adjustments this month quantities. The national total or NT summary calculations are cross-checked against the state data to ensure that all of the state data is included in the totals and the totals are correct. Finally, the use reduced year-to-date quantities are divided by the number of school year months included in the report to arrive at an average monthly usage, which is then divided into the ending inventory quantities to yield the number of months of on-hand inventory which is useful in identifying inventories that could be used to satisfy transfers. Once each national MPR is validated to be correct, the NT ending inventories are loaded into our bond monitoring spreadsheet program, which converts the pounds to dollars using the average price file and compares the NT ending inventories value grand total, also known as the monthly carryover value, to the school year processing bond to show the bond coverage and exposure at month's end. To find out how processors are going and controlling their bond costs, we conducted a school year 2016 and 2017 surety bond analysis for 34 MPA processors that process either one USDA food or one USDA food in different forms, for example, cheese, potatoes, and poultry. We chose one USDA food or one USDA food in different forms to minimize the influence of changes in USDA food costs so that we could focus on pounds used versus received and pounds carried over and how they are currently affecting the surety bonds. What we found was that seven MPA processors are approximately 39% of those that saw a decrease in their surety bond amount for school year 2017, experienced an increase in usage versus pounds received, and a decrease in maximum carryover pounds. We also found that seven MPA processors are approximately 44% of those that saw an increase in their surety bond amount for school year 2017, experienced a decrease in usage versus pounds received, and an increase in maximum carryover pounds. The remaining MPA processors fell somewhere between these two ends of the spectrum, with a total of 15 out of the 34 MPA processors showing positive to somewhat positive trends. 
While we are encouraged that progress is being made toward more efficient ordering and usage of USDA food pounds at MPA processors, it is clear that MPA processors can do more to control surety bond calls by tightening up their order forecasting and monitoring and by evenly spreading USDA foods orders throughout the year so they are not clustered in a few ordering periods, causing increases in maximum carryover pounds. Now let's talk about inbound order oversight responsibilities of coordinating, monitoring, and managing inbound orders and transfers. We encourage all MPA processors to communicate with your customer state contacts on a regular basis and to coordinate needed orders in advance of web SEM entry. As we are getting ready to start a new school year, now would be an excellent time to begin this practice if you are not using it already. You should remind the states of on-hand inventory in school and state accounts and assist them with determining the quantities of USDA foods to order based on the quantities of processed end items that they need. You should also let the states know when you will need each of their orders and where each order should deliver. Even after letting the states know when and where to send their USDA foods orders, you still need to monitor your inbound orders throughout the school year. We strongly recommend that you run a web SEM order status report wide open, that is without specifying any order selection criteria, every two weeks. You should review the inbound orders against on-hand inventories, processed end item ordering trends, and warehouse and plant capacities to determine if any changes are needed. Orders not yet placed on invitation or purchased may be moved forward or backward as needed to align them with usage trends, and delivery locations can be modified as necessary to adjust to changing warehouse and plant capacities up to 35 days prior to the start of the delivery period. Okay, what do you do if you find you have pending excessive inventories, or worse yet, excessive inventories on hand? Pending excessive inventory should be dealt with by moving back and or canceling any open inbound orders to align the inbounds with processed end item needs. Actual excessive inventory should be addressed more aggressively by moving back and or canceling any open inbound orders to align the inbounds with processed end item needs and by arranging and processing transfers from the states with excessive inventories to states that have a demonstrated need for additional USDA foods. Open orders for the states receiving the transfers can be moved back and or canceled as necessary to align the on-hand inventories and USDA foods orders with their processed end item orders and ordering trends. Thank you, Mark. Now we have another polling question. What should a processor not do to reduce inventory and associated bond costs? Should they communicate with customers and coordinate needed orders? monitor current inventory and work with customers to move trucks not on inventory or on invitation or purchase, work with states with excessive inventory to transfer to states who have a demonstrated need, or cross your fingers and hope it all works out before the end of the school year. So it looks like about 50% of you have answered, work with the states with excessive inventory to transfer to states who have a demonstrated need. However, all the answers are correct. D is the only answer that is incorrect. Now we're going to go on to our next presenter, Sherry Thackeray. Thank you, Linda. Mark, you made some very important points that I will be building on. While processors do not order raw materials directly from USDA, they must closely coordinate with state agencies and help forecast need to determine appropriate delivery periods while monitoring recipient agency balances and the overall state balance to ensure inventory is at the lowest cost-effective level based on the process average monthly usage. Average monthly usage is determined by the recipient's ability to purchase end products and accurate distributor reporting. For recipient agencies to purchase end products, the processor must ensure that USDA food is in current inventory, USDA food has been purchased and is in route to the processor, or orders have been placed by the state to go on solicitation for purchase. If end products are sold through a distributor, the processor is responsible for ensuring that the distributor is informed of the recipient agencies eligible to receive end products and the current level of inventory the processor is holding for each recipient. It is also important for the processor to ensure that the distributor provides notification of sales in a timely manner so that inventory levels are correctly reported on monthly performance reports. The processor may be held liable for a distributor sale of end products to an eligible recipient or to recipients without sufficient USDA food inventory at the processor. Selling end products at a discount before the USDA food has been placed on solicitation for purchase 
a practice known as front-loading, is not recommended because it creates a negative inventory. The processor assumes all risk and liability for front-loaded and negative inventory pounds. There is no guarantee USDA will be able to purchase foods to replace a negative inventory. FNS requires states to CC processors when requesting to cancel orders. Procedurally, FNS will not cancel orders if a state has an existing negative inventory or if cancellation of the order will result in a negative inventory as shown on the processor's latest submitted national monthly performance report. As Mark was saying, processor monthly carryover inventory levels have a big impact on the calculated bond for each school year. FNS recently issued bond letters for school year 2017, so this is a good time to review how FNS determines the bond level for processors. FNS determines bond levels for the upcoming school year each February in preparation for the bond letters to be sent out. We send them out by email mid-March. We're going to walk through an example of a current processor bond starting with the last completed school year, which is 2015. School year 2015 bond amounts were calculated in February 2014. Since processors have 30 days to submit monthly performance reports, FNS would have received December 2013 reports at the end of January, which is not enough time for FNS to reconcile all of the reports before the bond calculations need to be completed. Since we don't have enough time, we back up to the next complete set of reconciled reports, which would be November 2013. School year 2015 bond amounts were calculated as 75% of the maximum carryover ending inventory values for the reporting period of December 2012 through November 2013 multi-performance reports, and then rounded to the nearest $10,000. For those of you not familiar with the school year cycle, the school year 2015 began on July 1, 2014. The processor we're going to review had a highest carryover inventory value of almost $9.2 million, which calculated to a $6,890,000 bond. I also included the processor's school year 2014 bond amount of just over $5 million to illustrate the impact of carryover inventory as we go forward through this example. Since we only have reports for half the current school year when next year's school year bonds are set, we take the opportunity to examine inventory usage for the most recently completed school year. In this case, the school year would have been 2013. This processor received just over 8.4 million pounds of USDA foods and delivered end products totaling just over 8 million pounds, which is almost a 96% usage rate. It's not too bad, right? The processor received about 400,000 pounds more than needed. Assuming a 40,000 pound truck, that's only about 10 extra trucks. Before we look at school years 2016 and 2017, keep in mind that the assigned value of the USDA food raw material changes from year to year. The change in value does affect the bond, but not as heavily as the carryover inventory. So let's see what happened to the bond for the current school year. This processor had a highest inventory value of just over $11 million for the reporting period December 2013 through November 2014. Remember, we calculated the bond in February 2015, so November 2014 is the last reconciled multi-performance report. At the same 75% of maximum carryover inventory value, the processor's bond increased to $8,280,000 for the current 2016 school year. Looking back to inventory usage in the last completed school year, 2014, the processor used a little less than 95% of the inventory received. The processor received about 1.5 million pounds more than the prior completed school year and drew down about 1.3 million pounds more. In this case, the processor received about 500,000 pounds more than needed, or about 12 and a half trucks. You might be thinking, that's still not too bad, but these overages really compound over time. It was 400,000 pounds excess in school year 2013, 500,000 pounds excess in, 20, in school year 2014. That's a lot of bond for raw material that is carried over from year to year. Assuming this processor is using a high-value raw material like cheese or beef, Carrying an excess million pounds of inventory would add upwards of $2 million to the processor's bond. Looking at the same data for the upcoming school year, 2017, we can see this processor reduced the maximum carryover to just under $9 million from the previous year high of $11 million, resulting in a bond reduction of $1.6 million. In school year 2015, this processor must have followed Mark's advice to forecast need for additional orders against usage rates and work closely with the states to cancel orders, realign existing inventory to ensure usage, and align order delivery dates to reduce overall monthly carryover inventory. Proactively monitoring inventory and forecast needs for additional orders 
allowed this processor to draw down 1.3 million pounds of excess inventory that had accumulated over several years. Put all this data together and the lack of adequate inventory monitoring by both the states and the processor are very apparent. This processor, knowing that it uses, utilizes only 95% of pounds delivered in a school year, results in about 400,000 pounds of excess inventory, and a usage rate of less than 95% means about 500,000 pounds of excess inventory, we can easily see where an average size processor can quickly, quickly accumulate excess inventory. Now, I can see how, from a state's perspective, you know, carrying a few extra thousand pounds here and there or, you know, just carryover pounds might not seem like a big deal. After all, the entitlement is spent, the food has been delivered, and recipients will have access to the pounds next year. The perspective is different for the processor. If all 50 states ordered an extra, say, you know, 10,000 pounds, you know, rounding up to meet the truckload requirement or simply carrying more more inventory that is needed to the processor and just carrying that over from year to year, that unused inventory could add, easily add up to an extra million dollars in a bond for an average to small size processor. Not all of the responsibility falls on the processor. States play the primary role in this process by reconciling existing inventory balances, consolidating orders, and coordinating order delivery dates with the processor. States should approve end product data schedules for in-state processors or summary end product data schedules for multi-state national processors so that recipients can receive desired end products. While the state is not obligated to approve every end product produced by a processor, the state should work closely with recipients and processors to ensure that end products are available to meet meal pattern requirements and draw down inventory at the processor. Reconciling monthly performance reports is a critical piece of order management. In reviewing monthly performance reports, the state must ensure that processing yields are met in accordance with end product data schedules or summary end product data schedules, ensure that only state approved items are sold and that end products are sold only to recipients eligible to receive them, monitor current inventory levels, average monthly usage, and orders so as not to exceed six months of inventory at the processor, manage the inventories in such a manner to ensure usage. This could involve canceling or delaying orders as Mark discussed, employing sweep procedures such as Shinique will be discussing, or simply moving inventory from recipients that are not utilizing pounds to those recipients who can utilize the pounds. And for any alternate value pass-through system, such as net off invoice, states are responsible for a re-verification process to ensure recipients are receiving appropriate discounts from distributors. As Mark described, processors must submit monthly performance reports to each state within 30 days from the close of the prior month. Today is March 31st. So processors should have submitted February reports to all states no later than today. The American Commodity Distribution Association has developed template monthly performance reports for processors to use that meet the basic regulatory requirements Mark covered earlier for the national monthly performance report, such as beginning and ending inventories and pounds received and pounds delivered with year-to-date totals. However, reconciliation of the state reports require more detail and backup documentation than FNS receives for the national report. For example, state monthly performance reports list the number of cases of each end product delivered to each recipient agency and the number of pounds represented by the cases delivered. They may also contain results of processor sales verification for alternate value pass-through systems, copies of executed transfer forms, documentation to support condemned raw materials, grading certificates, or if required by the state, individual recipient agency inventory balances. Several years ago, FDS developed an online training module to assist state staff with reconciling monthly performance reports. Since this training was developed, ordering and receiving of USDA foods was moved from a system known as ECOS into the current web SCM. The ordering system may have changed, but the principles of reviewing and reconciling monthly performance reports remains the same. The training includes a variety of topics, including substitution, the process of reconciliation, discussion of processing and yield methods, and grading and verification oversight requirements. The training also walks through step-by-step -step examples of each type of reconciliation that a state could encounter, including the frequently utilized fully substitutable 100% yield foods like pizza, and standard yield fruits and vegetables, standard yield poultry, and guaranteed return red meat. Also included are less frequently utilized non-substituted fruit and the guaranteed minimum return for red meat and poultry. Failure to reconcile multi-performance report and insufficient monitoring of orders by state and processors leads to excessive inventories and increased bond levels. Do not hesitate to contact me if your state has questions concerning the online training or needs assistance reconciling multi-performance reports. Thank you, Sherry. Now we have another polling question. Who's responsible, who's responsible for monitoring a state's inventory balance at the processor? The state, the processor, the state and processor, or FNS? It looks like the majority.
majority are saying the state and processor. However, it is the state's responsibility solely to monitor inventory. Our next speaker is Shanique. State Street Procedures. Sherry and Mark just discussed the responsibilities of the processor and the state, as well as various tools that should be used when reconciling monthly performance reports and monitoring balances. A new method of order management that has gained momentum among the states is a process that has been dubbed the State Processing Inventory Suite. Over the past two to three years, a number of states have adopted procedures or policies that assist them in maintaining processor inventory balances that are in compliance with USDA regulations. States have had challenges with high inventories that have contributed to an inefficient use of entitlement dollars and pounds. Implementing sweeps allows states to move inventory not being used in a timely manner between recipient agencies or to other states that may have been in need of additional pounds. Sweeps also allow states to use excess pounds to offset future orders at the processor. On the other side, as the diversion of USDA foods to processors increased, some processors have also been faced with large inventory balances which subsequently led to higher surety bond amounts. With the upsurge of states implementing sweep procedures, many processors are now trying to accommodate the various methods and instructions for handling sweeps in each state they do business in. For processors, distributors, and brokers, inventory sweeps can be challenging and very time-consuming as each state does it differently. FNS, with the help of the Active Processing Committee, surveyed state distributing agencies to determine if they had any state inventory sweep policies or procedures currently in place. A total of 45 states responded to our inquiry and provided us with more insight as to how they handle excessive inventory at the processors. Of the responses received, 34 states have policies or procedures already in place, some of which are recent and not yet implemented. 11 states have no policy or procedure currently in place. Based on the responses, typically states with no policy or procedure were those that have state procured contracts or agreements and all orders to the processors are controlled and monitored on the state level. Some states do limited or minimal processing participation. And then the others use the rebate methods for value pass through. Surveys revealed some common practices across the state agency to include inventory sweeps were done one time per school year. Most states completed their sweeps in either June, October, or December. Waivers or extensions were allowed on excess inventory with an approved plan for usage during a specified time frame. Simple formulas were used, and an example of that is pretty much a district received 10,000 pounds of beef, used 2,000 pounds during the school year, 7,000 pounds were calculated to be excess, and those were the pounds that were swept. Most states allowed their recipient agencies to retain pounds equal to six months or less for use in the new school year. And pounds that are swept are transferred to a state account and used to reallocate to recipient agencies or states that can use the pounds timely and or for offsetting for next school year orders. Next step to the FNS. The intent of the survey to the states was to determine if there is a need for a national state procedure or a standard state procedure nationwide. Using the survey results, discussions with the states and the processors, and the results of the bond calculation we are better able to determine what approach needs to be taken, if any at all. We have heard from a number of processors as well as some states on promoting common best practices for handling excess inventory across the nation as we consider options. Some possible actions include having a national level processor inventory suite, which simply put is inventory swept at the processor by FNS is shown to be excessive and has had long periods of little to no drawdown activity. Another option, national level requirement for state inventory sweep procedure. In this method, FNS implements a requirement for states to have inventory sweep procedures in place and in use. Another option, national sweep templates for states. FNS will provide an inventory sweep template uh, using common procedures that we've come up with. This template would be an option and not required to be used by states. And then last but not least, state level sweep procedure, which is what we currently have out there. As is, states determine whether to implement a sweep policy or procedure and uses whatever method they choose. State responses reveal trends that we think are some good practices that can be compiled to create a procedure or template that is both effective and efficient. However, as states are all different and may have various reasons for certain practices, we do recognize there are pros and cons to some of the procedures used that we would like to further explore. For instance, timing. 
What is the best time of the year to implement inventory sweep? Not all months within the school year will work either for the state or for the processor. Would it be chaotic if they were all done at the same time? How often should inventory sweeps be, be completed? Should waivers, extensions be allowed? And for how long, if allowed? Inventory reallocation process. What is fair? Allow for some startup inventory in July through for July through August. Should transfers be allowed state to state to help in reducing inventory? Is use it or lose it zero balance the end of the school year a good idea? As FNS moves forward in discussion with the state and processors on the overall need for a more consistent and efficient sweep procedure, we are asking the states to revisit their current procedures and take a look at what you do and why you do it. Is your current process keeping your inventory balances at a reasonable level? And are your recipient agencies, processors, and distributors able to effectively draw down on pounds when needed? Or can it be tweaked or simplified to produce better results? At the same time, has the improved order planning, commercial processing, procurement, and forecasting resulted in reduced inventory? These practices should also continue to be promoted. We are also asking the processors to think about the pros and cons of the various state sweep procedures you have worked with, and we will plan to meet with the Active Processing Committee to discuss any input received from industry. At this time, there are no immediate plans for implementing a national sweep procedure. As discussed in our series of sweep processing focused webinars, with better forecasting, order management, and inventory monitoring, the need for a national inventory sweep procedure may not be necessary. However, if your state or processor currently has challenges with high inventories, please let us know so that we can be proactive and work on coming up with action plans for using or transferring the excess inventory. Thank you, Shanique and Mark and Sherry. We have gone through recapping order receiving and monthly performance reporting, the impact sales orders have on bonds, as well as how to manage some inbound orders and transfers, and state responsibility and monthly performance report tools, and the state sweep procedures current and potentially future. We will now take questions. And our Q&A lady, Ms. Cubity, has received some from the webinar registrants in advance, and we'll start with those. First question is, is there a chance the perfect truckload pilot will be offered to USDA foods other than cheese? The answer, currently, the pilot is only targeted for processor packs mozzarella and barrel cheddar cheese because the high, of the high volume and potential for excess inventory. We are monitoring the pilot progress and will consider expanding it to, for foods that meet the same criteria. The second question, I'm a processor and discovered a truck received two months prior wasn't documented on the NPR. Do I have to redo the last two months NPR? The answer, a missed receipt needs to be added to the national and state NPRs in the month that it was discovered and the entry of the missing receipt should be noted in the email submitting the report or in the report itself. You do not need to go back and update past NPRs. The third question, how do you edit in Web Supply Chain Management after you've receded a delivery and need to make a correction? The answer, if the amount received is under the truck amount, generally you can go in and add the additional cases. If the entered amount is over, you'll need to contact the Web Supply Help Desk and open an incident. These incidents are forwarded to AMS to be corrected. The fourth question. I don't always receive the inspection or grading certificate when a truck is delivered. Is there other paperwork I can use? The answer. One option is to request a copy of the bill of lading because it will have the quantity received and you can marry up the inspection and the grading certificates with the bill of lading for your files later on. The fifth question, who is responsible for enforcing the 48-hour receiving requirement per instruction 709-5 at NPA processors, states or FNF? The answer, if a truck isn't received within two calendar days, the contracting office, AMS, will receive the truck based on vendor and carrier proof of delivery documentation such as the bill of lading. The next question, why are NPRs standardized? The answer, we have worked with ACTA to standardize NPRs. However, we haven't enforced the use of the standard NPRs. We will be requiring the standard NPRs in the very near future. We also have a question of when will NPRs be automated? At this stage of the game, you know we are going through a business management improvement process. 
processing is a part of that. It, it has been suggested that we need a more efficient system for loading the NPRs as well as automating it, and that is on the radar screen. But in the near future, we will still be enforcing a standard format for the upcoming school year, working towards automating and uploading in the future with the business management improvement effort. We have another question. I'm a state agency. Can I get the NPRs sooner from the processors? The info is at least a month old by the time we get it. This came up at the uh, fall after processing committee meeting about the opportunity to get the NPR sooner than uh, 30 days after the ending month. The processors are relying on the distributors to turn in sales information as well as some have third party companies that are doing the reporting for them. We will continue to look at getting them in sooner, but at this stage of the game, the accuracy of the data could be compromised if we set up the process. We have another one. I'm a processor who has pounds that have carried over for a few years that are allocated in the state's account. Can I offer those pounds to eligible recipient agencies in the state free of entitlement? You're going to have to contact the state agencies directly. Each state is going to have their own procedures and policies in place to so work with them directly. On the USDA the Distribution Division and Home page, there's a new icon for the Business Management Improvement Process, and so you can go there for additional information. Okay, we have another question that's come in. Who has access to WebSCM? Can a broker gain access? Pennsylvania recently opened up a new system, which is an incredible tool. It is similar to Web. I would love to have access to similar information across all of my states. Well, the Pennsylvania did do a um, different system. It is very similar to Web in real-time and request-driven ordering system. Uh, that software, if it's purchased with federal money, is available for other states that wish to explore Pennsylvania system. In the meantime, a broker that is looking for sales order information for a state to determine where a state's orders are going to can go on the FDD website under WebSCM information and get a list of in-transit orders nationally for the school year and see them flowing through the system. That is an option. It's an in-transit report on the FDD website. And I think that is all of our questions for now. And sorry. Um, so we are going to wrap up the webinar. Is that good with everybody? And I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. And um, one thing that, that we've all noticed is that from one year to the next, picking up a few extra pounds a year is not a healthy practice with processing inventories, nor our own bodies. These inventories need to get leaner, as well as a few of us around here. So we suggest everybody strive to drop a few pounds and keep their inventory lean and cost effective and moving through the system. Thank you.